All right, welcome to section 9.2. We're going to talk about two things. We're going to real quickly talk about polarity, and then we're going to talk about orbitals and how orbitals form in bonding and how kind of we get this thing called hybrid orbitals. So, as we discussed in chapter 8, molecules have dipoles. They have dipole moments, and the dipole favors the more electronegative atoms. So, uh, in the example here, we have carbon or carbon dioxide, and oxygen is the more electronegative atom, so oxygen is going to want to draw that electron more, so we have a dipole moment. But one thing we want to talk about is just because we have a dipole moment does not necessarily mean the molecule is polar. So how do we kind of figure this out? Well, if we look at an example here, if we look at an example, we have water. Water is a great example. You are going to have to start determining whether a molecule is polar or nonpolar simply from the bonds without electronegativity table. So we know that oxygen is more electronegative, which means that <coughs> the bond is going to go that way. Our electronegativity, our positive is going to be towards hydrogen. Our negative is going to draw towards hydrogen. Same thing on this side of the bond. All right, those two arrows do not cancel each other out. If they were to cancel each other out, we would get what we call a nonpolar molecule because they cancel out. However, they don't really cancel out. They create a net bond that looks like that. We know that water is polar. So here's kind of a great example of water uh, being polar and showing it with uh, kind of the diagram. So if we do a handful more of examples here. Let's do the ones that are nonpolar first. So let's we're going to focus on these two molecules, BF3 and uh, CCl4. So if we take CCl4, chlorines are more electronegative atom. So we're going to have one going this way and one going this way. But what is going to happen to those two? These two are going to cancel out. Then if we do our other two atoms, this one is going down. This one's going up. What's going to happen to those two? Those two are going to cancel out. So when everything cancels out, we get nonpolar. Let's go to our second example here, BF3, nonpolar. Fluorine is the most electronegative atom in on the periodic table. So the bond is going to go towards fluorine. So we're going to have three going away, going away, going away. What happens is they perfectly end up triangulating one another. They perfectly end up triangulating one another. All three of these cancel each other out because they're at the perfect angle. Remember, now, if you have questions on why that happened, let's think about this for a second now. If I just did this one and this one, what would be my net force? My net force would be like this. What's my last remaining arrow here? Up, this. The two in blue would yield the one in green. However, I have one more here, and they're going to cancel each other out. So BF3 is nonpolar. Let's look at a couple of examples of polar. All right. First off, HCl. This one's super easy. Cl is a more electronegative atom. I have nothing to cancel that out. Therefore, that is polar. We go over to NH3 here on the right side. We have nitrogen's a more electronegative atom. So we have up and up. That would give us, those two combined would give us a yield up. Then we have one more hydrogen atom, which is going up. So our net is going to be like this. So we have very much electronegativity in this example. NH3 is polar. Last, uh, lastly, if we go ahead and do this, we have CH3Cl. So we have C in the middle, we have H, 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 and then we have Cl. Now, if we go ahead and kind of sum this up, right, there's really not too much of a difference between carbon and hydrogen. Right? If, if you did it, it would be, yeah, yeah. And uh, just really small arrows, right? Really small arrows. These two would cancel one another out. Or sorry. 
and that's back up. They would not cancel one another out. They're going to give us a small up. Right. Now between C and H, it's going to give us another larger up, and then our net between carbon and chlorine is a large up. So therefore, CH3Cl is a polar bond. So we are going to a polar molecule. So that is kind of how we're going to start working and dealing with polarity. Now, let's start talking about overlapping and bonding. When we've talked about bonding, we've talked about S and P and D orbitals. A lot of times when we've talked about S and P and D orbitals, we've talked about it in regards to when we do the orbital diagram, which is the 1s, 2s, and we go arrow, arrow, up, down, right? Remember, orbitals have shapes. Orbitals have shapes. So if we look at kind of how something bonds, how HCl bonds from an orbital standpoint, you're going to have H and H. H is a 1s molecule, so therefore it has two circles. It's going to bond together real nice like this. If we take HCl... H ends in 1s, Cl ends in the 3p orbital. Well, How does it end in the 3p orbital? Do the electron configuration. It's going to end in 3p5. The 3p5 configuration has this uh, kind of uh, hourglass looking p configuration. So that's how the orbitals look when they're bonding. Same thing if you had Cl, Cl. Just kind of we are going to start to visualize how bonding works. So anytime we kind of have uh, orbitals bonding, right, we have to kind of talk about the importance of repulsion between our pairs of electrons, and we have to talk about uh, really, yeah, we really just want to focus on the repulsion of our electrons and how that's going to focus. So that's kind of how orbitals are going to work. So we get a peculiar situation if we consider beryllium. In its ground state, we know beryllium is 1s2, 2s2. However, it's really not able to form anything because its orbital is going to be full. So for beryllium to have to, to for beryllium to form a bond with anything, since it's 2s orbitals form, it's going to have to create what we call a hybrid orbital, where it takes one of these electrons, kicks it over here, and we have what we call an sp hybrid. So we're going to have an sp hybrid with beryllium. That's why it's called sp. It, the, the 2s orbital is full. So to bond with anything, it's going to kick one electron into the p orbital, and it's going to create an sp hybrid. Now if we look at what this sp hybrid would look like from a visual standpoint, we know our s orbitals look like this. We know our p orbitals look like this. Our sp hybrid is going to look like this is really representative of the s. The hourglass is representative of the p. And that is our sp hybrid look. So just kind of putting that, showing how that actually looks and acts. Now, if we look at our hybrid orbitals, we have the bond BEF2. We would know, we know that BEF2 is going to be a linear bond from section 9.1. If we look at it from a hybrid standpoint, we're going to have S and P orbitals kind of overlapping. So we have SP bonding with P, SP bonding with P, and that's kind of how it's going to look. Remember, this is our special SP bond on beryllium, and fluorine is going to have a P bond. So just kind of starting to visualize what the orbitals would look like. Now, if we had to redraw the diagram for beryllium for an orbital, it's going to look like this. We're going to completely take away one orbital from P and merge it into SP. So we already had one orbital for 2S. We had three orbitals for P, 2P. But remember that it couldn't bond with that full orbital. So we're going to have the SP orbital and the 2P orbital. And that's kind of going to how it's look when it bonds. So really, we're just kind of starting to visualize how these bonds work from an orbital standpoint. We have S, P's, and D's. Now, if we use our hybrid models, 
there are a variety of bonds that can kind of can occur when we're talking about hybrid orbitals. A lot of times when you have two domains, you're going to have an SP overlap. When you have three domains, you're going to get what we call an SP2 overlap. Four domains, you're going to get an SP3 overlap. And possibly, if you have five domains, remember, P only has how many orbitals? Three. So we're tapped out of P orbitals. So now with five, you're going to have an SP3D overlap. And where do these orbital combinations occur? Well, if you have an SP orbital overlap, your geometry is going to be linear, just like we talked about in 9.1. If you have an SP2, it's going to be trigonal planar, or excuse me, whoop, sorry, trigonal pyramidal. If you have an sp3, it's going to be tetrahedral. And if you have an sp3d, it's going to be trigonal bipyramidal. So you have a potential for, depending on your number of domains, the potential orbital hybrid orbitals that can exist based on how many domains that you have. So if we have something like with carbon, we're going to get four degenerate three sp3 hybrids. So we have carbon, which, all right, carbon is in that p orbital. It's going to create four sp3 orbitals. So you can kind of see how each of the hybrids is going to react. Now, how does this work? Well, you have S, S, and then there are three different P orbitals, one on the X, one on the Y, and one on the Z axis. If they combine together, this S combines with the X, you'll get one. X combines with the Y, you'll get another. S combines with the P, you'll get another. And I'll kind of show you how those orbitals work. So hybridization is kind of how it works. Now, when we talk about hybridization, we talk about two different types of bonds. We can talk about sigma bonds, and we can talk about pi bonds. Sigma bonds, you can see here, are head-to-head -head overlap. We have overlap right here. So sigma bonds are head-to-head -head overlap. Sigma bonds occur in single bonds. They always occur in single bonds. Cannot reiterate that enough. So sigma bonds occur in single bonds. You can see it was head to head. They're squished together. Now pi bonds occur on top of one another. You can kind of see how they're forming on top of one another. Sigma bonds occur in double or triple bonds only. There's more force that uh, is created on a single bond head-to-head -head is much easier to do than stack them on top of one another. So when we talk about sigma bonds and pi bonds, we kind of have the idea. So like I was just got done saying, pi bonds are kind of that head-to-head -head overlap. Instead of squishing them together, they're uh, right on top of one another. Now, I also mentioned sigma bonds are, single bonds are always sigma bonds. Because the sigma overlap is greater, resulting in lower energy. But you can see here, if we have three examples, we have a single bond on the left, a double bond in the middle, and a triple bond on the right. Single, a single bond is only going to have one sigma bond. Double bond, though, here, this double bond is going to have one of each. The initial single bond will be sigma. The second double bond will be a pi bond. Then if we look at this triple bond here, the initial, the first bond, the single bond, would be a sigma. And then the double bond and the triple bond would be pi. So we have one sigma and two pi's for a triple bond. A double bond, one sigma, one pi. And for the single bond, we are solely left with a single bond, or sigma bond. Now, if we visualize what this looks like, it can really start to get super complicated from a visual standpoint. If we look at one CO bond, if we look at one CO bond, the bond between C and O here is going to be a double bond. 
When it is a double bond, you're going to have a sigma bond, which we have here, right here. And you're going to have what we have in blue, this, your pi bond. So you can kind of start to visualize what it will look like on the orbital. And you can visualize with other atoms uh, how it's going to work as well. Last thing, uh, we talked about resonance in Chapter 8, just slightly revisiting resonance. How you can draw the Lewis dot structure for resonance is that bond is always changing. Remember that bond is always changing, that double bond is rotating. So if you take that and you take that double bond is rotating, what you're going to do is remember a double bond has one sigma bond and one pi bond. Now ideally it would look something like this, right? Where we have single, single, and then we have our double. So when we have our double, we're going to have the sigma bond and then this pi bond. However, since that pi bond is rotating, because that double bond is rotating, the resonance structure is going to look something more like that from a visual standpoint. So just so you can kind of get a general idea of how that's going to work or how what that's going to look like. Remember, the electrons are delocalized because they're moving around. And the electrons are always delocalized in that resonance structure because they're moving around, which is going to give us this spread out pi bond rather than it specifically on one set of atoms. All right, uh, and that is it. We are not going to really focus on uh, the benzene, the two Ps for benzene, or the other types of resonance for that. So remember, two types of things for section 9.2. We have uh, polarity, which can cancel out. You're going to draw the bonds to cancel out. And then we have the hybrid orbitals of sp, sp2, sp3, and sp3d.